Well, good morning. We're continuing our series on fruit of the Spirit, and as you probably gathered from the various things we've looked at today, we're looking at joy. So let me pray before we start. Father God, take my thoughts and your word and speak to our hearts, and may our joy be found in your never-failing promises. Amen. I wonder where you find joy in your life. Not just things that make you happy, but something that really makes your heart sing. The dictionary definition of joy is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Personally, I find great joy in plants and gardens and flowers. I know that doesn't apply to everybody. Sometimes a challenge in conversations in our staff team. Each spring, I really look forward to the wisteria on the front of our house bursting into flower. The plant is a cutting from the really lovely wisteria at my parents' house. It's a great memory of my father, who was a a very enthusiastic gardener and died nearly 20 years ago. Um, The plant is a cutting. It took five or six years before it really got established and it started flowering profusely. So this is a picture I took last year in early May, just as it burst into flower, and the rest of the garden as well. Unfortunately, this year it was not to be. Pigeons came, they feasted on the tasty flower buds and stripped the blooms. All they left were naked stalks where the flowers should be. I think there's another picture, yeah. So this is a picture from a website that gives advice on pests and diseases in gardens. I was just too sad to take a picture of my wisteria shredded and stripped of all its glory. The source of my joy had been taken away. Perhaps it will flower again next year, perhaps even more profusely, but I can't be sure that the pigeons won't come back again and it will be ruined. Maybe, as I said, gardening is not a source of joy for you. But what about other things? Uh, Thinking particularly this week, what about sport? Do you find great pleasure and happiness from the success of your local or national teams? Watching football, rugby, cricket, maybe tennis in the last two weeks? Do you still have that source of joy when they lose or a star player leaves or somebody has a long-term injury? How do you respond when your source of joy has gone? Last week, Tim introduced our series on the fruit of the Spirit as he looked at love. He reminded us how much of our contemporary culture is driven by our desire to be loved and to love. The challenge he gave us was to recognize where we go to find love. Is it anchored in the love of Jesus? Have we grasped how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ? The same challenge applies to joy. Biblical joy is far more than just a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. It is a sustained and lasting emotion that comes from the choice to trust that God will fulfill all his promises. When our external sources of joy have passed away, will we still have the joy of God's promises as our anchor and our root? This is the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. So what does the Bible teach us about joy? Joy is a key theme through the whole of God's story. From the very beginning in Genesis, God looks at all that he has made and says, this world is very good. There is joy to be found in creation The psalmists rejoice at the abundance of the harvest, the flourishing of flocks, the joy to be found in God's presence. Through the Old Testament, there are reminders of the joy to be found in all that God provides for us, and we should rejoice in his generous provision. However, there is also a recognition of the reality of life. Our human condition is marked by self-centeredness, disappointment in others, loss, and ultimately death. Biblical joy is all about an attitude of mind, looking beyond our current circumstances to hold on to God's promises for the future. 
When Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt to freedom, they sang and danced for joy. They were going into the desert. There was a long and dangerous journey ahead to reach the land that God had promised them. But they rejoiced anyway. They were looking forward to their future destiny and trusting that God will fulfill his promise. This attitude of joy, despite their circumstances, and holding fast to a faithful God, marked out Israel as God's people. Even when Israel was oppressed by foreign invaders and carried off to exile, the prophet Isaiah spoke about the joy that awaits them when God raises up a new deliverer, a new Moses, and the joy they will have when they return to Jerusalem. As the Old Testament ends, Israel is still waiting and trusting that God will fulfill his promise, and they are living with an attitude of joy. And then, at the beginning of the New Testament, in Luke, Luke 2 and verse 10, joy breaks through as the angels announce to the shepherds, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The promised Messiah is here. And that is a message of great joy. God is faithful to his promises. Jesus himself is full of joy and gives thanks to his father as his kingdom ministry begins. But he is also realistic about the challenges we will face as his followers. When we walk in God's way and follow Jesus' teaching, we will face struggles, persecution, rejection, but our reward in heaven will not be taken away. In our reading today from John chapter 16, Jesus sets out for the disciples what will happen to him as he faces rejection and death. But he promises this is not the end. When he is taken from them, they will weep and mourn, but this mourning will turn to joy as he rises from the dead. God's promise to redeem his people and lead them out of slavery into the promised land has been fulfilled in Jesus. Their weeping will return to rejoicing and their joy cannot be taken away. The early church suffers much persecution and rejection, but people outside the Christian community remark how they live as a people full of joy. Paul's own life is one of struggle and difficulty, yet he chooses to rejoice despite his circumstances. The words joy and rejoice appear in Paul's letter to the Philippians more than in any other book in the New Testament, and yet Paul wrote much of his letter from a prison cell. Paul's joy was unshakable because it was rooted in Christ. Many Christians over the centuries have written about their experience of joy through very difficult circumstances. Julian of Norwich was one of the great mystics and Christian writers of the Middle Ages and is remembered for the phrase, all shall be well and all manner of things will be well. This might seem like a glib, wishful thinking phrase that's taken uh, out of context but for Julian, this statement is rooted in her understanding of all that Christ had done for her. This all shall be well quote comes from her writings known as the revelations of divine love. She herself lived in a time of great turmoil, black death, plague and war were raging and she personally suffered illness and loss. And yet in the midst of this, she wrote, I think we've got the quote, Andy, on the slide. God did not say you will not be troubled, you will not be belabored, you will not be disquieted, but he said you will not be overcome. And so he wishes us to love him and delight in him and trust greatly in him and all will be well. Joy is a profound decision of faith to trust in God. Jesus has overcome death, and when we trust in him, we have a promise that we will be with him in heaven. However, 
We are not left alone in the world to struggle on until the day came, comes when we finally meet with Jesus face to face. We have the Holy Spirit in us as a deposit, a promise, a seal to remind us that God's promise will be fulfilled. So how then can we experience this spiritual joy? When I was reflecting on finding joy in God despite everything that life brings, I was instantly reminded of our dear sister Shirley who died last year. Shirley was part of our life group and we, like many in our church family, dearly miss her. Shirley faced so many struggles and sorrows in her life and yet she remained so full of joy that flowed from the Holy Spirit. When anyone asked her how she could keep going with such joy through all the challenges she faced, she would say, it's simple really, Jesus loves me and I just need to remember that. Her funeral was a celebration of the joy she brought to others, but also a celebration of the joy that she was now with Jesus in heaven and experiencing her promised inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. The writer of Hebrews exhorts us to fix our eyes on Jesus. We are not alone in our walk in this world through good times and difficult times, in joy and in sorrow. The gift of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us is our assurance that Jesus is with us through it all. If we trust that Jesus' act of love in his death and resurrection has overcome death itself, then joy is reasonable in the darkest and most difficult circumstances. We're not being told to grit our teeth and carry on. We need to be real about our sorrow and disappointments, but also hold fast to the promise that this is not all that we are about. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul describes all the hardships, struggles, and difficulties that his companions have been through. He acknowledges his sorrow and yet he remains always rejoicing. This is not triumphalism, a belief that he should live in constant success and victory over every area in his life, but a continuing of the fullness of the joy in the spirit in the very midst of his challenges. Jesus is the basis of our hope and joy, as we were reminded in 1 Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds and trials, though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So is this spiritual fruit of joy just something for us to experience as individuals, to make us individually reflect the character of God? Well, I'd say yes and no. We are called as individuals to live in the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit and reflect the fruit of the Spirit, including joy in our lives. But it's not just about our own personal self-improvement. Our spiritual joy is rooted in the power of Jesus' death and life, and it should point others to Christ. We're not called to do it on our own. We are part of a community of believers, and our shared spiritual joy should mark us out from the culture around us. When we meet together, we shouldn't just rejoice at being together. We should rejoice in Jesus and all that he has done for us. Our external sources of joy may pass away, but our joy in the faithfulness of God is unshakable. The joy we share together in the power of the Holy Spirit will point others to God. So many people in our contemporary culture are looking for deep joy in their lives. So many are looking for joy in the wrong places where their source of joy can be snatched away. 
So as we trust in the God of hope and the power of the Holy Spirit, may we overflow with joy and share that joy with others. I'm going to finish with a verse from Romans 15. And as I say this, um, I just want it to be a moment of, of prayer for us and for you to just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.